Welcome to this Shared Value Initiative speaker series. Uh, I heard we have over a thousand people registered from more than 70 countries, which is particularly exciting. I am Sebastian Mezzeri, Managing Director at FSG, a not-for-profit social impact consulting firm seeking to drive equitable systems change. The Shared Value Initiative is one of three initiatives housed within FSG, and it provides a global platform for leaders seeking to address societal challenges with business solutions. Today, our speaker series is hosting a conversation focused on the inspired leadership that's needed to transform business into being a driver of equity. Corporate leaders are looking for ways to create positive impact through new practices, policies, and importantly, their core business. They consider how their purpose, culture, and governance align with their equity ambitions and what leadership it takes to bring commitments to fruition. Our conversation today features Dr. Vas Narasimhan, CEO of Novartis, and a leader from the pharmaceutical industry. But his insights, vision, and leadership reflect characteristics and principles that can apply to any business leader who is committed to advancing greater equity in our society. Novartis is in the top five of the world's largest biopharma companies and one of the leaders in providing access to medicines, which we'll be hearing more about in today's conversation. Now, as someone who trained as a physician and who has worked on global health issues for nearly 20 years, I'm particularly excited to be hosting this important discussion today. Disease prevention and treatment, unfortunately, are still not widely available to many people around the world. And one of the biggest opportunities for improving global health outcomes is better access to affordable health care. To set the stage, consider that the biopharmaceutical industry is undergoing a rapid transformation to live into its purpose, arguably delivering health outcomes for as many people in the world as possible. The rate of innovation is unprecedented with disruptive new technologies, such as messenger, messenger RNA vaccines for infectious diseases, but also for cancer, and personalized medicine, for example, gene therapy that looks to fix otherwise long course diseases in almost one go. These innovations offer the prospect of treating patients who live with chronic conditions, think hypertension, for example, in a single or with much less frequent encounters than a daily treatment, for example. So there is enormous potential for game-changing access strategies, even leapfrogging system and access challenges, especially in low and middle income countries where management of non-communicable diseases is particularly challenging with traditional chronic disease management in primary care settings. And tremendous health impact down the line, but also business perspectives. Now, please mentally bring this archetype back to your own industry. The transition you're experiencing post COVID in an era threatened by climate change and geopolitical instability, the opportunity for product service and or business model innovation that results from this transition and consider a few gnarly questions. How does a company move to making its products more accessible to the underserved, especially its innovations? How important is it to use the core business to do so? What is the role of inspired and visionary leadership in driving transformational change to achieve that? Does the organizational purpose and culture need to shift in order to fulfill a, press a pressing societal need while still growing profitably? Those questions are not specific to pharma. However, Novartis offers a perfect example of a corporation that has been embracing the challenge in a profoundly changing industry. In the next 45 minutes or so, we look forward to hearing more on these topics. And for our session today, we'll begin with a short keynote from Dr. Nara Simhan, and then Alison Chantel, the editor-in-chief of Fortune, will join him for a conversation. We will have time for audience Q&A, so please submit your questions using Q&A function, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Before we get started, I would like to quickly thank the sponsors of the Shed Value Initiative speaker series, Discovery, NL, Merck, Truist, Walmart, Abbott, Sanofi, and 3M. Through their generous support, we're able to make this programming available to the general public free of charge. 
We greatly value the support of our sponsors and their commitment to advancing more equitable outcomes for society. Now it's time for me to introduce you to our first speaker of the day. Vas Narasimhan is a physician and has served as CEO of Novartis since 2018. Vas has focused his education and career on improving human health and on his personal purpose of inspiring a healthier world. Under his leadership, Novartis has undergone a strategic and digital revolution centered on expanding access to innovative medicines around the world. He's also transforming the business from within to unleash the creativity of employees and make culture a driver of innovation, reputation, and performance, ultimately in service to patients around the world. Vas, welcome, and I look forward to hearing your remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sebastian, and, and thank you also for the colleagues at the Shared Value Initiative for this invitation. It's a great opportunity to share some of the perspectives I have and on behalf of Novartis, the things we're doing to try to live the principles of the shared value concept in our daily work. Now, to begin with, you know, Novartis has undergone, a, as Sebastian noted, a pretty remarkable transformation over the recent years. We've moved from being a conglomerate to really becoming a focused innovative medicines company. Through over $100 million of transactions, we've transformed ourselves to a core business of identifying and developing incredible medicines, reimagining medicine, as we like to say, is our core mission, and getting access to those medicines to patients around the world, and really doing that consistently at scale uh, in a way that can deliver health outcomes for patients. Now, along the way, we've also had the opportunity to reflect on our own journey as to how do we really ensure we're contributing to tackling some of the world's greatest challenges in healthcare. Previously, when I've spoken to the Share Value Initiative, I've shared how Novartis started in 1980, primarily focused on donations, and over the last 40 years has evolved from building models in global health to later coming for for-profit models to provide access to medicines to now our focus, which is really ensuring access to innovation. That is now, I think, the core way we can live our values, ensure we're having a broad impact on society, and have that be part of our core mission and also deliver the business goals that we have. Because fundamentally, in order to do the incredible work we do, reaching close to 300 million patients a year with our medicine, we have to deliver as well for our shareholders. There's three stories I thought I would share with the group that highlight, I think, some of the things we're now thinking about as we continue to evolve our models and really ensuring we have the impact that we want. The first is using technology to tackle what I think is probably the most challenging and important non-communicable disease that's continuing to spread around the world, and that's heart disease. Number one cause of death and disability on the planet. Yeah, we know it's so hard to get patients to consistently get diagnosed and also to meet the goals that they need to meet for hypertension or cholesterol to really ensure they get the outcomes. And when you think about uh, communities in Africa, cities in Africa, with the substantial increases we're seeing in some of the risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease, we have pretty significant challenges to these healthcare systems. Now, along the way, we've been able as an industry to develop what are called RNA therapeutics. Now, this is distinct from mRNA uh, vaccines. Really, RNA therapeutics are using the cellular machinery to tackle important drug targets that can impact cholesterol, hypertension, et cetera. We've had the opportunity to license a medicine that gives you the opportunity to treat cholesterol with a twice a year injection. Right now, we're working to roll that medicine out in Europe, in the US, and beginning that march across the globe in the Middle East and in Asia. But it really is, I think, an exciting opportunity to take a population health, public health-based approach to really tackling this incredibly important challenge for healthcare systems. It'll reduce the cost for healthcare systems, hopefully get patients to goal so they don't have repeat heart attacks or cardiovascular events, and of course, is an important business opportunity for our company. I think it's a nice case study to show how when we advance biotechnology and we use that technology against important disease burdens, we can have a pretty important impact on some of the biggest challenges facing healthcare systems. The second example I thought I'd share is the challenge of diversity in clinical trials. We know in the US in particular, we face tremendous challenges in having diverse clinical populations in clinical trials, particularly 
of participants from black and brown and underserved communities. This is a longstanding challenge, a very complex challenge, not one that will be easily tackled. Novartis launched a, a program called the Beacon of Hope with $50 million commitment from our Novartis Foundation to work with 26 historically black colleges to build up the capabilities, both in the students, the medical students and in the staff to be able to run clinical trials at scale in their universities and in their communities. The hope over the long run is we'll be able to put more trials into these centers, get more diverse patient populations, which will better reflect the diversity of the United States and the world, and over time also improve overall healthcare delivery in these communities. The hope is we actually can raise the standard of care and also enable our medicines to be used in broader populations in the United States, where also health equity is a, is a critically important challenge. I've recently had the opportunity to meet with the Dean of Morehouse Medical School and see firsthand how this kind of program can really start at least to fundamentally change what is a vexing problem. The third example I thought I'd share is the challenge of sickle cell disease in Africa. So we know that sickle cell disease affects around 4 million children currently in Africa, and yet is, is severely undertreated. As a chronic disease of children, where so much of the focus is on infectious disease, it's typically been neglected. We began efforts a few years back in Ghana to first introduce newborn screening so we could start to identify children with sickle cell disease. We then worked with partners to bring low cost generic medicines to at least allow the early stages of sickle cell disease to be treated with antibiotics and a medicine uh, called hydroxyurea. And then over time, our hope is to bring new innovations to hematology and sickle cell disease into Africa, including as Sebastian mentioned with our collaboration with the Gates Foundation, powerful technologies like cell and gene therapies. Now this is a long run view, but in the end, we have to be able to tackle also chronic diseases of children in Africa to really move the needle in these healthcare systems. These three examples are just emblematic examples, I think of efforts that show the possibility of when you use technology, creative approaches to access and a commitment to improve patient outcomes and really tackle some of the biggest disease burdens that communities and countries face you could really create shared value both for society and your company, our company in the case of, of Novartis. So we remain committed to this uh, in the long run. We're one of the largest R&D operations in the globe, committed to medicines for tropical disease and equally continuing our work across five major therapeutic areas. And I hope over time, we can completely close the gap between access in wealthy countries, access in low and middle income countries, and really in doing so close the gap in health equity for the long run. So thank you very much. Thank you Wes for sharing those three powerful stories. Um, there is clearly one big takeaway for me as, as I heard you go um, through those pharma examples that I will offer as a, as a pull up and a transition into the next conversation. Um, I believe as a society and certainly corporates in particular, uh, we're all going through unprecedented challenges with global awareness about inequities, which is evidenced by the COVID pandemic, most of them being unacceptable in today's modern world, but also the rise of stakeholder capitalism, or should I say a call to go back to the roots of capitalism to answer unmet needs across society as a whole maybe. Uh, and also definitely a ticking clock on the world's natural resources and the sustainability of its communities. And with that comes an unprecedented pressure on companies to report against ESG targets and metrics, to demonstrate how they are contributing in a way that justifies their profit making. And the challenge that CEOs face today is twofold. Uh, on the one hand, the reactive compliance, license to operate, social contract uh, agenda. And you can definitely be a CEO remembered for decently steering your company through those turbulent times. Uh, but you will most likely add to the L side of your PL with more compliance expenditures, donations, etc. So, what if you could also be remembered as a CEO who turned these challenges into a business opportunity to create business differentiation and a new ability to thrive in the new environment? And I think Vast, you offered three examples, you know, going into the, the high end uh, technology innovation of uh, RNA medicines, but also actually bridging the gap between the traditional approach to an already widespread disease, albeit unaddressed like sickle cell disease, and paving the way 
with maybe traditional uh, ways of, uh, of, of, uh, of improving access into actually uh, being able to launch the more innovative solutions. Uh, have, having already developed the markets, the relationships, the ecosystem that would be necessary for a company to be able also to have an investment and a business case uh, in this application. So for that type of uh, the second opportunity that I, that I mentioned, you would need the vision to fully embed purpose into your core business and deploy innovation in ways that depart from business as usual. And you mentioned, for example, uh, improving or increasing clinical trial diversity, which is an example in the pharma sector of actually doing business, the upstream R&D part, uh, differently from what it, how it has been done in the past, with a view to already understanding and taking the needs of the, under uh, the underserved into account from the get-go. But more importantly, you'd also need to create the conditions within your company to overcome the inertia, create the right incentives, and unleash and empower creativity and risk-taking from the ground up. I know those questions are on everybody's lips, and I know we want to tackle some of them in the upcoming conversation with Vas. So for this fireside chat, let me now introduce today's moderator, Alison Chantel. Alison Chantel uh, joined Fortune in October 2021 as Editor-in-Chief. She previously worked for Business Insider, where she was appointed Editor-in-Chief in 2016 and became the youngest and only woman to run a global business publication. She has appeared on the major media, hosted conferences, launched a podcast, and is a judge for the prestigious Gerald Loeb Awards in business journalism. Alison, thank you for joining us today. Over to you and Vas, and I'll be back to close the event. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, Vas, I'm so excited to dig in to everything Novartis is doing. But first, I wanted to start with just a big look at the biopharmaceutical industry. It's about 120 years old, but the pace of innovation just seems to be skyrocketing really fast, um, so much so that there's actually a risk that it's developing so quickly, we won't have the ability to get all those new medicines to patients efficiently. Um, it seems like with a problem that big, partnership is the only um, solution. And you've definitely been partnering with everyone from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to even competitors, um, nonprofits, government organizations, educators. What's your general philosophy on how you tackle a giant issue like this um, and when to effectively partner with other organizations, how to make that progress happen? Yeah, thanks, Allison, and great, great to see you. I, you know, I, I think the pace of innovation is extraordinary at the moment. When you look at it, for the first 115 years of this industry, we had small molecules and biologics. And now in the last five years, we've added to that gene therapy, cell therapy, radioligand therapy, small interfering RNAs, antisense oligonucleotides. And so it's a pretty amazing pace. And with that, I think really important gains uh, in terms of how we can deliver eff eff efficacy and safety for patients. And yet at the same time with healthcare systems under strain and being able to be able to fund all these new technologies is clearly a challenge. I mean, what we've learned in, in bringing cell and gene therapies around the globe, and it's worth noting both our cell and gene therapies are now uh, reimbursed in over, I think 30 in one case for, or in 40 in the other case markets, including in middle income countries, is that you have to create a pretty clear value proposition and really show the healthcare system that in the long run, these technologies will save costs and lead to better outcomes. And if you can't deliver that value proposition, of course, you won't get, get the uptake. But if you can, if you can communicate that well, the power of most of these, many of these technologies is one-time therapies or less frequent therapies, higher compliance. We have a bit of a frozen situation here. Um, give us five seconds and we'll see if he returns. Hmm. 
I didn't have a plan for this for a frozen for a frozen Zoom. All of my all of my questions I need Vast to answer. Uh, Sebastian, do you I have? Was, I was uh, wondering if it was, if it was my computer, <laughs> as I'm very customary with IT issues. Um, I, I thought actually where Vast was going was a was a clear call that I I cannot miss. You know, for obviously um, thinking about linking the ways in which you contribute to society with an understanding of the business value that is being created for you as a company, but also the value that you offer to patients and uh, and, and society. And um, at, at the moment, uh, I would actually argue that the systems for measuring and for building these cases are pretty underdeveloped all across the board. And it will be uh, a, a big you know, journey um, along which companies have a role to play, but not only them. Uh, to try and really institute, understand, and, and establish the standards and metrics that will also enable all players together uh, to understand the, the value proposition, the value that's being created. So actually, your point about the importance to uh, think about those access and um, health system strengthening issues in partnership uh, with uh, traditional global health actors, other players in the industry, and even other industries, um, think about the mobile industry, banking, and, and other sectors that all have a role to play, uh, by and large, in healthcare delivery uh, is going to be crucially, crucially important. Yeah, I, I think one thing he was also getting at and that I was going to ask him. Back. To... Oh, he's back. <laughs> back. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, sorry, okay. sorry. Uh, apologies. Okay. Yeah. No, but I think on partnerships, I mean, I, th I think as Sebastian was saying, I mean, it's such an inc incredibly important role. And our, I think we've learned with the Gates Foundation, we've learned with other partners that if you really want to tackle these problems at scale, particularly in more challenging environments, you have to find great partners. So in addition to defining the great partners, one thing you were alluding to uh, or, or simply stated before is there actually has to be a bottom line benefit to like you want to do what's right for the world, what's right for customers, but ultimately it also has to affect the bottom line in a positive way. Um, how are you finding tackling these big global problems are impacting your bottom line? Are you seeing immediate results in positive territory or is it just a long-term play? You know, I think there's probably a few different categories. I think for some areas, particularly in middle income countries, we get pretty good opportunities to, I think, build new markets that we wouldn't have expected otherwise with some of these new technology areas. I mean, a case study is our, our gene therapy is launched in Egypt and it's being taken up by a national program in Egypt, a middle income country, because they see this as a better way to ultimately tackle uh, a rare childhood illness in their country. Um, but I would say for low income countries, there is a much longer, longer term play. I think in, in terms of a lot of the work we do in Africa, we see this as an exciting area in the long run that if we can build the capacity to take on new medicines for non communicable diseases, there is no question the continent needs that innovation. And if we can build the systems to take that up, that will ultimately deliver benefits. But that is a much, much longer term investment strategy mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and as you noted, there's you know many different types of inequity um, when it comes to access to medicine and racially, there is as well, racial, gender, all that. But you've definitely been focusing on racial disparity through Beacon of Hope in partnership with 26 historically Black colleges and universities. Um, you're trying to address the root cause of these disparities in health. It's a systemic issue. Um, when you're trying to deal with a systemic issue like that, uh, what have you found? Um, how are the partnerships going and how are you making improvements to something that is just so seeped in the system? Yeah, I think first we have to start with being humble with respect to this challenge. So I don't think uh, our initiative or any one initiative is going to solve this uh, in, in, in a fast way. Nonetheless, I think we can start the process to really build up the capabilities uh, over time. And I think what we, we, our hypothesis is to start with the educational system. If we can train medical students, and we now uh, have medical students from these 26 colleges coming to our research universities and research campuses, if you can train investigators, if you can start to place clinical trials, over time, you'll build an ecosystem that will be able to then absorb many more clinical studies. The other thing I'd say about the power of a clinical research as a kind of keystone way to improve healthcare systems. In general, when you see more clinical research activity happening in a healthcare system, the quality of the healthcare system goes up, the openness to new technologies in the community goes up, and it actually, I think, leads to better outcomes, but also better markets as well, because markets that were otherwise closed begin to be opened uh, for the right reasons. 
So I think it's it's a it's a exciting opportunity, but again, this is another very long term uh, you know uh, initiative. It's not going to move the needle overnight, but if we can stay consistent, that's why we commit fifty million dollars over ten years, and hopefully we can get some meaningful change. So I want to open up to more of your general leadership philosophies as well. We have leaders from a multitude of industries on the call. Um, you're doing some really, really difficult things at the company right now. You're in the midst of a major pivot to become an innovative medicines company with five core therapeutic areas that you've identified as the future of Novartis. I believe they're cardiovascular diseases, immunology, neuroscience, solid tubers, and hematology. Um, everything else you are either kind of spinning off, rethinking, restructuring. Um, and you're also really going hard into big external markets. Um, you're adopting a U.S. first mindset with the goal to become a top five drug maker there by 2027. You're going big into China. Um, as a leader, there's just a million things you could be doing. How are you determining what to focus your energy on and your company's energy on? And how are you determining what's a distraction? So this has been a big journey for, for Novartis. I mean, we've been a conglomerate for most of our history. And I think that what the observation has been that given how fast technology is moving, how complex markets are, the fact we operate, I mean, we're actually one of the leaders, probably the leader in bringing innovative medicines to the world. We reach 300 million patients a year in 140 plus countries with our medicines given just our global scale. Tremendous complexity that we take on. So we really ask ourselves, where can we add the most value and where can we really deliver on our mission to reimagine medicine? And when we, when we take that lens, a lot of the businesses were, that we owned were better served to be separate businesses. So we exited consumer health. We exited eye care devices. We spun out a company called Alcon. We're in the midst of spinning out our generics business, Sandoz, and really focusing on our core. And then the therapeutic areas you mentioned are, are therapeutic areas where we believe we have deep know-how, deep scale, and the ability to find the next breakthrough medicines that will actually move the needle for, for healthcare systems. The tricky balance, I think, is while we want to focus on the big five therapeutic areas you mentioned, we're not going to lose our efforts in global health. We're one of the leaders in finding new medicines. Just last week, we announced we're starting a phase three trial for a new combination for malaria. And, and our commitment to non uh, to uh, tropical diseases is long and, and will stay with us. And, and at the same time, when you think of geographies, there are four geographies that will drive 75% of our growth, US, Germany, Japan, and China. But that doesn't change the fact that we are the most global of the pharmaceutical companies and we want to maintain our reach into over the, those over 100 markets. So that's a tricky thing as a CEO. I don't have a magical solution to it, but you have to just strike those balances want to drive the value creation, want to have the biggest impact in, the, in where you can from a PL standpoint. And you don't want to lose that mission, which is so important to our, our, our employees, to the patients we serve, and also to me as a global health, uh, if somebody with a strong background in global health wanting to move the needle on these big challenges. And with these changes, um, it also makes some tough decisions. Of course, I think there's about 8,000 people who lost their jobs as part of this transition. Not, obviously not an easy decision on your part. How do you reorganize in a way that considers equity? Um, how do you bring the company with you when you're making these tough decisions and choices for the future of it? Yeah, I mean, as part of that transformation I just described, I mean, it's over $100 billion of transaction. We also had to re-architect our company to say, how are we going to be designed to be a pure play when for the last 50 plus years, we've been a conglomerate. Um, and so that met, led to some pretty difficult decisions on how we are designed and really streamlining um, the company. Now, first, we always treat our people in the best possible way. And I think we've tried to be generous in how people, I always think we want to treat people well when they leave. And then they ultimately, over time, will I think treasure their time at, at Novartis. And we've really tried to do our best to do that. Uh, and I think most people who have gone through the, the difficult road on that have ultimately found that to be the case. So I think that's an important element of the story. And then I think the other part is to really pivot for the organization uh, and the, you know, when you think about it, 90,000 post Sando, 70,000 plus associates we will have with us um, going forward to maintain their belief in what we call our inspired, curious, unbossed culture, which really is about empowerment and really about really ensuring you can use culture to drive performance and kind of accountability culture that we drive deep into the organization. 
and not to let that the changes we've made create cynicism in the organization. Now, that's not an easy road to walk. We're in the middle of it. All right, we've done this before. We'll see if he comes back. I think he will. And, and if not, we'll bring Sebastian back. All right, Sebastian, I think it's your time to shine. <laughs> Always happy to, <laughs> to come back, <laughs> even though, of course, I'm <laughs> much, much less inspiring than, than Vass. Um, I, I really liked where, where Vass was just coming with, I think, three levers that we recognize very often when we think about shared value strategies. Uh, one about actually, you know, contributing building and delivering on your mission with the assets and, and skills, et cetera, that you have. In that case, you know, continuing on the innovation with malaria, which represents a huge unmet, uh, unmet medical need, um, paving the way for um, innovating and being able to leapfrog that innovation uh, in underserved communities for tomorrow by actually understanding and focusing on your strength and your core assets. Uh, that's a story about, you know, uh, uh, getting out of the uh, the uh, consumer health generics business, et cetera, that is probably better served in other conglomerates or, or, or companies. And uh, the last but not least, crucially important pillar of, you know, your people uh, and making sure that the foundations uh, at every level of the organization uh, continue to embody this culture, are, are aligned uh, with, uh, with this value creation uh, journey, and also trained in actually new ways of doing and measuring um, business value creation and social value creation. And I think Novartis is on an inspiring journey from this perspective, which certainly is applicable across many industries that are that are represented uh, among our participants today. Agree. Um, this is actually a good moment for me to see through the many, many questions we're getting from the audience, which is really great. Um, I'm gonna work some of these into the conversation with Bass when he returns. Um, some include, I think a really important one is uh, besides, this is great. Come back, come back, come back. I'm so welcome, sorry welcome. To, to the Holocaust. <laughs> I'm not it's sure why today my internet is giving out on me. I've been doing this for a long time. You know <laughs> what? It's like, authentic. This happens to us all. You're just like all the rest of us. Um, so I, am, I don't know. I don't know if you got the, the back half of what I was saying, Allison. But just that you know, you have to you have to navigate an organization through a challenging period, but make them believe in the culture that you launched five years ago, inspiring, curious, on boss and empowerment um, concept. And I think we'll get there, uh, but I think certainly in these times, I think many leaders have to go through making very difficult decisions, but making sure your associates feel convinced by the mission for us reimagining medicine and a culture that we really believe in and inspire curious and unbossed people. Yeah, um, I want to touch on unbossed because I, I love that phrase and it's kind of counterintuitive to what you think of from the boss. Um, but first, I want to go to something you've said you've called yourself an accidental CEO was this this wasn't your grand plan and how have you you've been a CEO since 2018 so you have a few years under your belt, um, uh, half of which have been during a unprecedented pandemic. So how has how did you stumble into the CEO job I don't think you really stumbled there you worked your way there, um, but then how did you develop your leadership style as well. Yeah, thanks, Allison. I mean, I, I um, when I was training as a physician, I, I really wanted to work in global health, and most of my um, mentors really supported me to work on topics like HIV/AIDS and AIDS treatment in Africa and Botswana, um, tuberculosis and multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, working um, on many important public health initiatives around the globe. Um, I sort of, you know, one had a very big interest in seeing how the private sector challenged healthcare challenges, and that led me to ultimately joined Novartis and, and a great uh, opportunity to work in R&D in many different places, as well as in the business and vaccines and pharmaceutical space, briefly at our generics business. And I had a great role developing medicines for the world. For five years, I was the head of our drug development enterprise, one of the largest in the globe, just developing medicines from everything from malaria to cancer to heart disease uh, to multiple sclerosis. Um, and that was incredible. Um, and then, you know, I say accidental CEO because it wasn't on the plan to become, I thought that I would do that and figure out what to do next. And then um, the, uh, I guess the leadership of the company asked me, would I want to be considered? And I said, sure, I would be considered. And ultimately they thought I was the right, right person. 
Um, so I never had this grand plan to be a CEO, but I think it's been the, the most incredible opportunity, most challenging, most grueling. Um, you age in dog years, uh, the beard is getting really gray really fast, but um, overall it's been incredibly valuable to navigate the company through, a, as I said, a massive transformation, a pandemic, hyperinflation, all of these things, right? Um, and we're still here, still doing doing solid work, and we'll keep doing that. So talk about unbossed culture, because you know, as the boss, there does need to be a hierarchy in a company for it to function. It can't just be entirely flat. Um, how do you empower your workforce without giving up the power yourself? What does unbossed mean? You know, unbossed, the, the concept behind it, it was really in Scandinavian companies where they talked about this, was draw, keep it, create a deep accountability in the organization for performance. And if you do that well, then you can really, you know, focus on removing obstacles for the people. I mean, the concept is actually, I think, 2,500 years old, where it's been talked about servant leadership first appears in ancient texts and in various Eastern philosophies again and again, that the, the leader should really step away once the people understand where they're heading and really just remove obstacles and come from behind, not from the front. So that was the idea. I have to say, in practice, it's been a little challenging to roll out because it's easily misunderstood as a phrase, um, as anarchy, or we can do everything. But I think we're whatever we want. But I think we're getting there step by step to really get people to understand that it starts with accountability, accountability for results, accountability for performance. And when we're all aligned on what we need to accomplish and being accountable for it, we can create a lot more space. All right. While we wait for him to come back, um, take your opportunity to drop in any more questions you have, because um, we're going to be going to a QA and a um, shortly after he returns, um, seeing some amazing questions in here. Um, Frank uh, Kalberg has one on um, what can we do to strengthen psychological safety. Uh, it's incredibly important at a recent CEO event I was at number one thing on people's minds for their workforces was mental health. Um, we're really seeing an explosion in that, that people say that could be the next pandemic from this pandemic. Um, so great question there. Feel free to drop in more um, and we'll we'll get um, and Vass is back. Here we go. Okay. Um, so Vass, um, I think I was getting what you were saying that, you know, it can gone wrong. It's hard to, it can be hard to roll out can create anarchy. You obviously don't want that, but empowering through accountability um, and letting your team take charge and not being, you know, micromanagey, um, but empowering them to make their own. And, and I think I think one of the things I'd say is that it really depends on the kind of um, workforce that you have. I mean, Novartis is a knowledge workforce, millennials are mostly a very young workforce. In order to get the best ideas, uh, you have to be able to create space for those ideas, because in the end, we win with ideas more than anything else. And um, you can't micromanage those ideas. You can't um, overly structure, I think, um, how, the, how the teams are gonna work. That said, we've also learned that we've gotta put pretty clear guardrails in at our scale. And that's been one of the things we've learned as we've rolled this cultural transformation out um, across the company. So I'm gonna go to audience Q&A for a little bit here. Um, we have one from Frank Kalberg. Um, it's a question about equity. What can we do to keep health insurance premiums at levels that are affordable for all? You know, I, I, it depends on where in the world we, we can talk about it. I mean, in the U.S., it's a remarkably complex um, system. And I think it, the, probably the overall, the system needs to get reformed to focus much more on patient outcomes um, and, and be better aligned. At the moment, there's so many various disincentives and complications in the U.S. that lead to really multiple drivers of increases in, in premiums. I think, I think globally, um, you know, in general, I think with the aging populations, governments have a huge challenge and how they're going to be able to fund, you know, that, and, and our view is that by investing in technology to reduce the need for hospitalizations and advanced care, and really allow people to hear health, healthier lives and, and intervening earlier in disease will reduce overall costs because the premiums are really driven by catastrophic care or more severe care when, when diseases get quite progressed. I hope we can get to a place where we can use things, technologies to identify cancers earlier, diseases much earlier, intervene much earlier so people don't need as much complex care and that should reduce costs over time. But that I think is a longer term goal. Awesome. 
Um, that's great. I'm going to jump now to Cameron Barnes. I mean, just to be clear, that's a very meaty topic. You know, we could spend a whole discussion on that. And you're right, different parts of the world. It's very different. Um, there's a lot of work to do there. Um, just to include one more, Cameron Barnes has a question um, on a different topic. Uh, how does Novartis see NGOs playing a role um, supporting systemic health disparities? Um, if it's core to the strategy, how might we maintain the NGO capacity to meet the scope of your goals? I mean, we found partnerships with NGOs, particularly, and as we've rolled out tackling communicable disease, but also non-communicable non -communicable disease, as well as communicable diseases, to be absolutely um, critical. I mean, I think one of the things we've learned over time is we need partners who are in it for the long run and can really stay with these problems for a very long period of time, um, because most of these problems will require a decade or more of consistent activity, whether that's hypertension, whether that's malaria, in any one of these areas, we need partners who can do that for um, for the long run. And then we always look for complementary skills. I mean, we're our job is not to build healthcare infrastructure; it's to bring innovation uh, and access and affordable approaches to healthcare systems. And then we need partners who can help build up the capacity of the system to diagnose, to ultimately move patients through the treatment system, and ultimately get the care that they need. Um, and that's often in many countries done through the NGO community. Excellent. Um, and one other question was, how can you protect, um, it's, it's, this is, the questions are very varied, it's, so this one is going to hop again, um, but how can you um, look out for the psychological welfare of your employees? Um, how can Novartis help with that, given that that's probably kind of the next phase of this pandemic? I mean, look, I think the pandemic has taken an incredible toll on, on everyone. It's clear um, inside companies, outside of the company. Um, we try to do our best. We have a lot of different services. Um, we have a program called Energize for Life. We have lots of online um, services. We support counseling for our, our associates. Um, is it enough? I don't know. I mean, I think we certainly try to offer all of those things. In the end, it's up to our associates to decide, do they take advantage of those opportunities? Um, we're also learning we have to create more structure around hybrid working, because sometimes hybrid working just means working all the time, which is not the intention either. Um, and, and activity, I think, in the current virtual world or more virtual world is misunderstood for impact. And we try to keep emphasizing to our people, it's about impact. It's not about how much time you spend on the Microsoft suite. It's not that important. What really matters is are we ultimately moving the needle on our goals and for the company and for healthcare um, more broadly. So there's a lot of work to do. I don't have the magic solution other than I think you have to have a broad range of, of options for people and then people have to look at what makes sense for them. Okay. Um, one more question. How do you think about the S in ESG? Um, you know, I think to broaden that out, uh, leaders are expected to wade into political, social waters quite a bit. Um, everything seems to kind of seep in. Um, your workforce expects you to have strong opinions um, on things that traditionally have not been historically talked about by CEOs. How, so how do you think about that S? Yeah, it's complex. I mean, I, I think we we are have learned through multiple different trial and error approaches that we have to focus our commentary on areas that um, are core to what Novartis does and, and be careful about how we move further afield because we're, there's always, I think, complexity when you move too far uh, from your, your core area. So healthcare topics, topics that impact patients, yes, we have to be, be prepared to comment on. Uh, innovation, we have to be able to comment on that. We can't kind of comment on everything. We have to stay focused. I think the other part, just because there's an opportunity to comment on ESG and something Sebastian said at the start of this, I mean, we are at an important crossroads on this whole enterprise of ESG shared value, because as ESG becomes regulated, as the SEC, as various European governments, as the EU Commission regulates more elements of reporting, I think there's a risk we lose the, the, the bigger spirit of what we were trying to do in trying to have companies come back to their core purpose. I mean, I think when Ronald Cohen wrote you know, his, his beautiful book on capitalism, he talks about the six sources of capital. And I think really the spirit here is that companies need to move and think beyond just financial capital, but think about social capital, think about natural capital, think about intellectual capital. And I think we have to keep that narrative alive in companies because as this moves more and more to a regulated space, 
we will naturally focus much more on a very limited number of metrics that are going to be highly, highly regulated. And I think that's something for us as a community of people who are very interested in concepts like shared value to keep that alive. And that's one thing I observe even for us. I mean, our focus now is how on earth are we going to meet the SEC guidelines and the EU guidelines and the Swiss guidelines and the German guidelines. You know, talking a little bit less about making sure that we're um, really, you know, living our purpose and making our purpose profitable and in doing that, having an impact on the topics that we want, really want to have. I think that's an important point. Um, and a final question for you that kind of stems off of that. You've said that the most powerful thing that we can have um, that can improve the world is leadership. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about why you think that and what you feel like leaders can do to make more meaningful impacts on society. Yeah, I mean, that the comment on leadership comes from, you know, I, you know, I love the work of, of Steven Pinker and others that reminds us that when you look at the long arc of history, the data would such this is the best time, despite all of the challenges, to be in, be alive. I mean, it's actually a historic time in terms of life expectancy, quality of life, uh, lack of conflict and war. Overall, the world is actually in a remarkable place, and that's primarily because leaders have been able to keep challenging society to tackle these problems through innovation, through you know, um, bringing groups of people together to ultimately conquer these these issues. And I ultimately believe while it'll be very daunting, we will tackle climate change in a similar way because leaders will ultimately be able to galvanize people, bring people together and ultimately solve these problems. I love the idea that, that leadership is about creating the space for people to achieve their full potential to impact the world. And when leaders do that, you have such a multiplicative effect across an entire system, you can make really big things happen. So I keep reflecting on that myself and my job at Novartis, but I think more broadly, that's why society has been able to progress consistently over all of these years to the place we are today, because human leaders are able to galvanize other humans to tackle these problems and, and society moves forward. Um, powerful words to end on. Thank you so much, Vass. We're going to pull Sebastian back. Um, thanks for the great discussion. Yeah, my apologies for the technical issues on my side. Made it fun. <laughs> No worries. We've, we've definitely all been there. I was actually surprised that I was able to go through without too many of my own glitches. Uh, it's hard to conclude, actually, after such an insightful conversation. Thank you both, Vass and Alison, for your time and uh, the great and engaging conversation. Um, maybe one uh, one very quick serious takeaway and a more joking one but I, I think the conversation today even though it was a short one and could have deserved you know an entire day of uh, of going deeper uh, offered some insights uh, around almost all the dimensions of uh, of shared value and the the opportunity and the challenge for corporations today definitely the theme of living into into purpose um, focusing on equity the challenges and opportunities of making innovation uh, more, more accessible across many industries. And as Vas just insisted on also the importance of uh, taking a step back and realizing the, the time horizon where, where we all, I mean, the pandemic had definitely this effect of creating shorter term uh, urgencies even the, the the climate crisis, which you know arguably is an, is an enormous and urgent um, issue to to tackle, can create this false sense that we absolutely need to resolve pretty much everything immediately. And actually, there are timelines to also strengthen systems to engage with uh, with uh, ecosystem partners, and also to bring the um, uh, the, the the companies and other uh, organizations where they need to be culturally and from a skills and capability perspective in order to be able to address those challenges and and seek the opportunities. So, in our consulting practice, uh, we're, we're also seeing now getting back to considering the longer horizon. And as somebody much wiser than me said uh, said once, you know, the better time to plant a tree was was yesterday, but the second best time is today. So don't forget that some of the the progress we've talking we, we've been talking about has at least a 10, 15 or more time horizon. Before we close, uh, I want uh, all of you to know about an upcoming Shared Value Initiative virtual event uh, on December 7th at 10 a.m. ET or 4 p.m. CET. We'll have the final session of this year's speaker series, 
which will focus on ensuring a just transition for the communities most impacted by the climate crisis. Matthew Heimer, executive editor for Features at Fortune, will host a conversation with Leanne Gale, executive vice president and general counsel at Nestle, the world's largest food and beverage company, and Beatrice Tumon, global director for social impact at CEMEX, a global construction and materials company. Details and registration can be found at shedvalue.org. Want to take a moment to thank you, our sponsors, once more for supporting this speaker series and send a shout out to folks working behind the scene to make this event possible Georgie, Emily, Gail, and Bobby. Thank you to our audience for attending this webinar today. We wouldn't be here without this dynamic community, and we hope you found this session valuable. We look forward to seeing you at another Shed Value Initiative event soon. Bye bye.